Our next speaker um, is a gentleman by the name of Christian Dorbrich. He is a senior landscape architect and a horticulturalist, and thus is senior project manager in the Rotterdam office of West Eight, which is one of the most significant transdisciplinary practices in the world, I would suggest. He has over 22 years of complex landscape design experience on his belt and has been particularly active in recent years in China, where his expertise with urban regeneration projects and the creation of new generation urban parks has not only won many awards, but also created the foundation of the Asian portfolio for West Eight. He left Germany way back in 2006 to join West Eight as he was attracted to the practice by its interdisciplinary and poetic approach to design, factors that have chimed very much with his own approach to his work um, ever since. The title of his talk is Green Living Rooms in the City, a poetic approach to the urban green, and it focuses very much on the aspects of site-specific design of the urban forest. So Christian, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'll share my screen. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll briefly introduce uh, uh, West Aid as uh, being a uh, um, design uh, office in Rotterdam. We have a small uh, crowd of uh, uh, 60, 70 people designing uh, landscapes and uh, urban designs uh, throughout the world. <clears throat> when, when we get uh, asked uh, uh, what is the style of, uh, of West Aid, uh, we, we always answer that, uh, that, that there is not a, a specific style, that there is not a specific design uh, direction that we always apply, but we very much uh, work from an uh, uh, engineering uh, aspect as uh, coming from the Dutch uh, um, history of landscape engineering. We, we look very much to, <clears throat> to, to the reality of the site, but also to the cultural uh, aspect of how would people use the space, how would this uh, be uh, uh, taken into, into, uh, into the use, and how would uh, people want to, to uh, interact with the, with the landscape uh, uh, in, in the long perspective and from their own cultural background. So looking at the, um, the um, perspective of the different projects, they, they show a broad diversity of um, of design aspects, uh, but all of them, they, they try to react uh, to, to their context uh, very much. And uh, we, we already learned uh, today that that is very um, uh, important, especially uh, looking at the, at the changes that, this, that the cities are making and also that our climate is, uh, is making. So thank you for inviting me today to share uh, some of our practical experience uh, and I've uh, selected uh, two uh, projects uh, to illustrate uh, uh, our experience. But first I looked into what is urban forestry. And uh, this uh, very important uh, quote from, uh, uh, from Alan, uh, who is, is very much pointing towards uh, these mosaics of uh, vegetation uh, that, that, we are, uh, that we are creating and the, the, the woodlands that interact uh, with, the, with the well-being of the human being. But there's a lot of uh, aspects that we need to take in consideration uh, when, when creating uh, those. Initially, uh, we discussed uh, the, the poetic approach uh, of uh, the urban green as a, as a main title. But then we also uh, found out together when we rehearsed uh, before, the, before the meeting that it's very important to, to look at the site specificness of the urban forestry. My first uh, example is a project that uh, um, for the airport of Schiphol in Amsterdam, uh, where we have been involved uh, uh, since the um, eight, early 90s uh, into transforming the uh, airport. 
uh, we, we see a continuous um, a change in the perception of infrastructure, uh, not only uh, being a, a infrastructural um, uh, element in, in, this, in the cities, in the landscape, but also uh, to, to become a place uh, to, uh, to live, a place to uh, have interaction with, uh, 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 with the cities and uh, with the human beings. And uh, they, they need more than, than just the infrastructural quality to it. So when, when we got uh, involved in the Schiphol Airport, you see here, it, it was a very much uh, focusing on the infrastructural aspect and the sense of arrival and also the, the environmental quality uh, was, was not yet uh, uh, um, developed. <clears throat> we came up uh, with a scenario for a, for a green airport uh, where when you arrive uh, to, uh, to the airport, you would be welcomed uh, by, uh, by a green infrastructure and you would also be welcomed by a sense of the landscape uh, and a sense of uh, elements of, of the Netherlands that you feel you have arrived uh, to, uh, to uh, our country. But um, uh, in, in the research of how, how could we do this, we, we got uh, confronted by, by a very important uh, detail, uh, which would influence our, um, uh, our design uh, uh, very significantly. And, and this might not be an immediate uh, thought, but, but uh, uh, when looking at the vegetation and the urban forestry, there's a conflict uh, uh, with uh, um, our, um, with, a, with a other natural components like the birds. So uh, we, we found out that, uh, uh, that there is, uh, there's not a possibility to use a, a, lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the trees that we wanted to use and that would uh, maybe uh, create a, a diversity of, of, uh, of vegetation uh, because of the threat of, uh, of, of birds uh, falling in love with, with these, uh, with these uh, trees. So, in a, in a long process, we, we found out that, uh, that, that there would be a chance to, uh, to plant the trees and we wanted to, to create a larger mass of, of the trees, like, like an airport forest, but that would only be possible with the right uh, species. So we came across the birch tree as a, as a promising uh, one. Uh, where, as you see here, the, the, the big birds, they would, they would not uh, appreciate uh, the, uh, the, the soft and the softer twigs and would not uh, um, uh, be creating a problem in that sense. So the, um, uh, we, but at the same time, it needs to be a, a green approach that is not an approach of a, of a park uh, land, but really of a reforestation that needs a simple approach, a simple formula that can be started in one point and can be rolled out uh, through, uh, uh, throughout the years and uh, can, can be established uh, step by step. So what we see here is, a, is, a, uh, is only a fragment of the intervention, um, uh, creating a sense of arrival for the, for the, for the main uh, frontage of the, of the airport. But in fact, uh, the plan was a much, much bigger plan so we, uh, we found out that it would be good to, to create a foreground, a coulisse, uh, for, for the, for the um, uh, airport. And these are very early renderings, which I wanted to, uh, not even renderings, they're uh, handmade photo collages, one of the first uh, of the office, uh, which were at that time in the early 90s already proposing urban beekeeping and uh, uh, in introducing wild, wild lawns and uh, wild vegetation to the place uh, in contrast with um, uh, inner uh, courtyards. And it, we came up with the idea to, to uh, make the birch planting a sort of a very simple strategy, not only as a sense of welcome, but also as a, a compensation green strategy when the uh, uh, airport was uh, changing its form, extending its, uh, um, its uh, spaces 
uh, adding new um, areas around the uh, airport for business parks and uh, for further developments. So the, the birch uh, planting could always be a compensation planting that would fit into a, a broader concept and would uh, tie together uh, the, the airport with the surrounding developments and would create a joint airport uh, a forest uh, at the at the uh, at the long term. So in the beginning, uh, uh, already um, uh, uh, thousands of trees were planted, and uh, they were extended around uh, the the infrastructures. Uh, time time to time, we we combine them with um, seasonal planting, like you see here. Uh, we combine them with uh, an infrastructure and urban developments. Uh, they are uh, combined with uh, uh, um, larger water areas and uh, compensating for, uh, for incisions into, into the landscape and uh, are creating um, uh, um, oh, yeah, a wild um, a natural uh, airport uh, forest that uh, uh, is extending every year still. Uh, so this, um, uh, this, this uh, initial idea is not uh, ending yet, it's, it's always uh, uh, applicable. There's a handbook, there's a guideline um, uh, where, where this is taken as a long-term strategy uh, and is still uh, handled. Combined with the maintenance uh, aspect of it, uh, um, uh, a lot of the surfaces are easy to maintain, to be maintained. They are um, handled uh, uh, even in uh, agricultural uh, uh, way. Um, but of course, it's not always going well, these, these kind of interventions. I also wanted to share this uh, blooper with you. In, in uh, <clears throat> 2013, um, uh, was a mistake in the maintenance uh, by a very enthusiastic uh, team who wanted to give more visual access uh, to the um, to some of the billboards and uh, without uh, knowing about the consequences of of their action they uh, they were cutting a lot of the trees believing that uh, these trees could easily uh, handle this um, and was this made a, a reforestation necessary that uh, was um, uh, trying to compensate the the loss of 10 years of this um, these areas of development um, and by by now already these uh, uh, areas are um, back in into into a functional uh, airport forest again so we see here is a, a, a quite a recent photo uh, we see that uh, a lot of the um, uh, planting have uh, uh, established already uh, they they form uh, uh, larger surfaces uh, of uh, airport uh, forest and uh, these this, uh, uh, spaces are still expanding and we are very uh, proud every time that we use the airport ourselves, uh, how, how, to, uh, how the sense of arrival has uh, changed. My first uh, project uh, in, uh, in West 8 uh, was um, uh, Madrid Rio in uh, Spain, uh, where the, um, and I still like to talk about it, although we finished it already 10 years ago, uh, it, it's a larger scale intervention where the um, um, uh, mayor of um, Madrid was uh, trying to uh, make a big um, <clears throat> change to the infrastructure world of, uh, of the city and, by, uh, and had the plan to bury uh, six kilometers of the city um, highway uh, underground. Um, the, the city highway at that point was uh, uh, along the central river, the river Manzanares, and was blocking the access uh, to, to the river. In his uh, uh, plan, uh, the uh, river uh, would get accessible by a landscape on the surface and uh, uh, two times uh, four lane highway would be buried underground, an intervention uh, that should be realized uh, in <clears throat> in uh, three to four years and while when we um, visited the site here is in uh, 2005 uh, we we saw that uh, uh, this was already liberating a surface of uh, 120 uh, hectare uh, in in the inner 
uh, in an inner city area of Madrid. It gave us the chance and we proposed uh, in our competition uh, that uh, it could link uh, uh, the northern and southern space of, uh, of the green developments through the city and give a new green facade uh, to, uh, to the city. One part that I want to speak uh, in particular about is the uh, so-called, um, <coughs> sorry, is the, the, um, uh, the boulevard of the Pines, the Salon de Pinos, uh, going from the north to the south, uh, accompanying, the, accompanying the river uh, for six kilometers and uh, having a, a, a tunnel uh, as, as the base. So for us, this was like building a green on, on the top of a rock. And uh, we see that uh, here, uh, not a lot of tree species would be um, uh, suitable. So we, we looked around in the natural landscape in the, in the mountains of uh, uh, the northern mountains uh, uh, attached to Madrid. And we found that the, the pine trees would uh, be a suitable uh, option to look at. So we came up with an idea of creating a, a boulevard of uh, pine trees that uh, would um, be situated along the river. And uh, we made a plan that, uh, I mean, in total, we planted almost 50,000 trees uh, in, in this uh, project, but uh, of them, uh, 8,000 uh, were supposed to be uh, pines. And uh, uh, when we uh, proposed this uh, to the municipality, we said this cannot be just lollipop trees. This cannot look like a nursery along the river. We, we want it to look more like uh, Dali, more like, uh, 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 like something that, that is changing its uh, form that comes uh, close to, to the most beautiful trees already existing in the city here. Um, uh, the, pine trees in the Retiro Park in Madrid. And we wanted to develop uh, this tree planting with a choreography and uh, uh, wanted to, to, to really influence the shape and the, and, and the sequence of the trees. <coughs> we came up uh, with plans to, to manipulate the trees, but we were not sure how, how this uh, could work we, because we didn't have references for this. We asked the municipality for a testing ground and they gave us a, a large piece of land and budget to, to make a test. Uh, you will not recognize me, but that's actually me holding this, uh, this uh, pin. And uh, uh, we had a possibility to check if the grouping of the trees, um, vandalism proof uh, installation, uh, or uh, in enjoying grouping of the trees would, would actually work in this, uh, in, in, this uh, uh, in the way we thought it. But uh, we were not uh, happy with, uh, with many of the results and also uh, were uh, um, trying to achieve this on a larger scale. Uh, we, we switched uh, uh, to uh, the idea of uh, um, selecting a lot of uh, the material as, as natural material uh, that was trans transplantable at the same time, but uh, had a natural growth uh, to it and uh, that uh, some of that was material that was immediately appealing to us uh, but um, but for for other um, city projects this would have never been uh, selected so this is uh, one of my colleagues uh, I, I selected most of the 8,000 uh, trees with uh, together with uh, with her uh, during uh, uh, quite a substantial um, uh, time. The result is, uh, uh, is not only uh, the burying of uh, the, the, uh, the infrastructure, the uh, liberating the surface uh, from the traffic, but it's a continuous boulevard of natural trees where people can uh, promenade along, where we introduced the uh, 12 uh, playgrounds for the families that uh, visit. Uh, wild boars uh, uh, of Madrid uh, transforming into playground uh, features and where all the generations uh, can, can meet under the still growing canopy of the pine trees.
Uh, this attracts at the same time uh, people who are jogging, who are biking, and, and became one of the uh, life, uh, lively places in, uh, in Madrid uh, where you can enjoy the, the, the shade and uh, the uh, sculptural trees. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Christian, for a very stimulating um, presentation. And it was, I must admit, I've been to both sites, so I have actually seen both of <laughs> those um, on the ground. So um, thank you very much for that indeed. Um, some some very you. stimulating stuff. Okay, we move on to our fourth speaker uh, for the uh, afternoon, Steve Connor. Uh, Steve is the CEO of an outfit called Creative Concern, which is an ethical communications agency that focuses on sustainability, places and social issues. His agency is part of a worldwide network called Do Not Smile, mm -hmm. uh, which is dedicated to promoting and delivering good communication. As I hope we're all aware, good communication is one of the key factors in achieving the urban resilient goals we're all very keen uh, and seek to promote. He also works extensively on community forestry and wider forestry issues and has only recently stepped down from being the interim chair and a trustee of the Community Forest Trust here in the UK. He was one of the authors of the Northern Forest Manifesto, which subsequently led to the launching of this very significant initiative in the UK. And thus he acts as an advisor to the Northern Forest Board on strategies partnerships and communications uh, and is very much involved in the Northern Forest. His title of his talk is The Northern Forest Grow Back Greener, although it just says Northern Forest Tales from the Northern Forest. Um, and I pass you over to Steve. Sir, the floor is yours. Sorry, I just need to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Alan. And um, uh, it's really lovely to be here to explain the journey we've been on with the Northern Forest. Um, if you want to uh, um, follow me on Twitter, the, hash, the uh, handle is Headstretcher. Um, and please do tweet about the Northern Forest. There's the hashtag um, that we use for it there. Um, so I'm going to start in January 2018, um, which is when we launched the Northern Forest. Um, and it had been a few years in the making, uh, and we've been putting our manifesto together. Um, but we launched with uh, £5.6 million pounds of government support for our first wave of planting. Um, and we secured a place in the UK's 25-year environment plan. And the big green button itself was pushed by the Prime Minister on the Andrew Marr show. Um, so it meant that we, we did actually achieve a very significant um, profile. And in fact, by the middle of the week of its launch, we'd reached about 150 million people in terms of an audience. So it was the biggest, um, according to the team of the Woodland Trust, one of the core partners, it was the biggest initiative in terms of profile that any of us had been involved in. Um, now, uh, to quote Victor Hugo, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. And what I want to explore is the idea that this is, uh, the Northern Forest is an idea whose time has come. And, and if you look at the, the sort of urgent issues of our time, where we stand right now, particularly post-COVID, um, there's a, a really interesting connectivity between our plan, which I'll go through in a minute, for the Northern Forest uh, and what we can achieve. And, and we believe that the Northern Forest has a direct and urgent role to play in addressing uh, a number of regional, national and international priorities. So, we're confident that, that we have a role in economic recovery. The whole issue of levelling up the north um, here in the UK is something that the Northern Forest can help to deliver. We know that greater health and well-being is a huge priority post-COVID and, and there's a clear role for that. Uh, a number of studies during lockdown have shown that access to nature uh, is incredibly important to people and makes a difference. Um, we've shown that it can provide green jobs and I'll talk about that further in a moment. Um, help to achieve a just transition to net zero. 
Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, help to deliver on uh, a number of climate emergency net zero declarations that have been made, but in a way that actually boosts social justice. And of course, uh, we address resilient landscapes and ecosystems. So there are a number of different ways in which uh, the, the phrase grow back greener is appropriate here. Uh, we think that's a slightly more uh, productive phrase than build back better in this context. So I just wanna go back um, uh, and uh, revisit why we launched the Northern Forest back in January 2018. And what I'm gonna do to, to um, start us on that conversation is just play uh, a little bit of film um, that sets out uh, the context. And for those of you not in the UK, um, it's a lovely little journey to the north of England. Um, so here's a very brief film. Um, so that gives you a sense of, of, uh, of the place itself, I hope. The, the partnership um, we formed to establish Northern Forest was the four community forest initiatives uh, across, um, across the north of England. That's Manchester City of Trees, who are very much involved in the running of, of this event. Um, Haywoods, based around Hull. White Rose Forest, um, a really dynamic uh, community forest for Yorkshire, um, which uh, is hugely connected to our, our chair for this event, Alan, um, and the Mersey Forest in Liverpool. And those community forests established for uh, almost 30 years now um, were joined by the Woodland Trust, a hugely important national organization uh, to bring this all together. And for all of us involved, um, it was uh, a really very bold adventure and experiment in partnerships as well, because none of us had worked together in this way before. Um, the need was clear, um, so if you look at woodland cover, the northern forest area spanning from Liverpool um, to Hull uh, has a very low woodland cover of 7.6%. If you compare that to the UK average of 13, it's poor, but then if you look at um, uh, our colleagues across continental Europe, um, it, it's poorer still. So there was clearly uh, a great need for, for something to be done. And, um, the prospectus, the manifesto that we wrote was launched for 50 million trees to be planted over 25 years, as well as importantly bringing more woods into active management. The prospectus we wrote actually uh, set out a case uh, for cooling and climate adaptation, and that was pretty much the headline act for it, but also uh, beauty, aesthetics, um, the economic prosperity that uh, increased woodland can bring and uh, a really important evidence base for that radically improved health and well-being. And, and when we published this, we had a particular focus on air quality, improved urban air quality. Um, practical forestry, timber and bioenergy was part of our pitch and nature recovery networks and the net gain in biodiversity. Uh, more poetically, um, just to follow up on Christian, we also had the vision of a red squirrel, a cheeky red squirrel jumping onto a tree in Liverpool and making it all the way across to Hull without having to touch the ground. Uh, and so those were the things that were stimulating us at the beginning. Here, it, here is the map that you saw in that film a moment ago, which gives you a sense of where this is based. Um, so that is made up of the, the, the four community forests and the Woodland Trust is operating across the whole of that area. And you'll see there, there's a kind of light green halo. Um, and that halo area is really important to us because we realize that for the areas of the North that aren't covered by community forest programs, we can operate there too. Uh, and make a difference. Um, just to give you a glimpse of the work that went into the prospectus, th this is a, a bit of the GIS mapping that we did to show where the priority should be for planting more trees. And so the actual landscape has a capacity for about 350 million, not 50 million trees. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but we carefully mapped out a number of different scenarios and this is the optimum scenario for where they could go. Um, and we had a real sense of 
um, trees delivering significant urban public good. Um, so this is one of the, the diagrams that guided the manifesto around shade, air quality, um, reducing uh, the urban heat island effect and creating green space for healthier lifestyles. So I just want to go back to the idea of grow back greener. So that was the northern forest and what we set out to achieve. Um, but within the, the plan itself, there were a number of things that really are hugely relevant today. And I've mapped some of them out here just to discuss very briefly, um, because in our manifesto, um, there, there were strong cases to be made for green space boosting productivity, um, increasing property prices, uh, increasing the take up of occupancy in industrial commercial zones, right the way through to outcomes like trees being shown to improve commuter happiness uh, and well-being. Um, and obviously a very clear one for everybody on the call today will understand uh, the way that urban forestry can radically reduce negative economic impacts as well. So it's not just all about uplift, it's about countering things like pollution and flooding. So these are some of the themes that uh, provide a positive economic case. But if you go very tightly to a, a really current discussion around green jobs, um, what we offer through a, a, a very sort of pulled together program to the Northern Forest is direct jobs in terms of delivering Northern Forest, um, but green skills and innovation, that increase in productivity I was talking about a moment ago, the opportunities for new markets and things like agroforestry and bioenergy. Um, and we've already found um, the, the potential need for more tree nurseries and greater supply chains, as well as a knock on for other sectors like tourism. So there is definitely something that can be achieved uh, that's hugely important. And when we put it all together and did our scenario building, uh, we estimated that our original uh, vision for the Northern Forest would cost 500 million, but the return on investment for that would be 2.5 billion in terms of public benefits. So we thought a very strong economic case. Now, one of the things I wanted to touch on this afternoon was the way um, that the, the Northern Forest is ground up um, activity. And what I mean by that is the fact that it's being delivered by the Woodland Trust, which is a, a membership public driven charity, um, and the community forests, who are, as the name suggests, completely rooted in community, means that this is uh, a ground up activity. So here's a classic moment uh, in community forestry, which is this is where um, Manchester City of Trees had their biggest ever volunteering day. Uh, with a youth MP and a, a radio DJ, Sel, uh, Sel Spellman, came along. They planted 10, 000, um, sorry, 1,050 trees with over 200 volunteers. Uh, and that's a classic sort of um, uh, classic moment in community forest that makes it ground up. Um, but what I wanted to do is just before we went into lockdown in our first year of planting of the Northern Forest, we actually got some clips of people planting um, uh, as part of the activity. And I thought it'd be fun this afternoon for you to almost escape the Zoom window and be out on a planting exercise. So I'm just going to play another quick film which shows you some Northern Forest planting in action. Today we're at uh, the fantastic Nid Gorge, uh, which is very close to Knaresborough and Harrogate in North Yorkshire. And we're really excited the fact that the Northern Forest is, is, is coming to this area. We'll have the opportunity to create more fantastic woods uh, like this for, for wildlife um, and for people. The creation of the Northern Forest and planting more trees is a prudent and really important approach to help our future as humans and also importantly for all biodiversity. In Europe, over 40% of land, land is covered with trees and forests. Yet here in the UK, only 13% of the land mass has trees. The Northern Forest is a fantastic opportunity to redress that balance. Here we're just planting trees for the, the Northern Forest Project. I personally love forest woodlands, and so this is a, kind of a, a pleasure for me. Okay? And, and I also oh, 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 do this quite regularly. Hey, to help make sure that uh, there's basically enough trees for uh, at least in whole to see. So we're planting trees. Yeah, wonderful. So why are we planting so many trees? So we can get more oxygen. More oxygen. The tree um, likes to eat the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and then it breathes out oxygen. So it's a nice friendship between us people and plants. Yeah. So that gives you a sense of um, what it's like out on the ground. Uh, it's a, a very human activity. And what I wanted to do just before I, I wrap up was just run through 
the planting season that's just gone and some of the projects that are delivering the northern forest. So here is one very, very recent example, a couple of tweets um, following 6,000 trees being planted with the Mersey Forest in Walton Hall Park in Liverpool um, uh, and local people suddenly discovering this mini forest in their local park taking shape um, uh, and being blown away by it. Um, so it's a classic one that literally has just taken, taken place. Um, over the other side of the Northern Forest in Yorkshire, um, a, an amazing project um, at Broughton Hall, um, which is being delivered by White Rose Forest and funded through a program called Trees for Climate that hopefully you've heard about already um, in this uh, series of, uh, of events. And at Bra Broughton Hall is um, uh, quite astounding. I've got some stats for, for this particular project because it's, it's so significant, but it's 160 hectares have just been planted. That's uh, around 250,000 trees um, for the Northern Forest. So a big chunk of our target there, part of a wider nature recovery program um, and part of a particularly uh, a push by White Rose Forest to help reduce flood risk for urban areas downstream through the Air Valley and into Leeds. So Broughton Hall, a huge project. Um, uh, here's where um, Northern Forest started in effect. So this is the Smithills Estate. Um, which is uh, run by the Woodland Trust and, and very much involving Manchester City of Trees. And there's the, um, the mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, actually kicking off the Northern Forest in 2018. With uh, That's the first official tree in the Northern Forest. So, so far there, there have been 90,000 trees planted, 100 volunteers recruited, and 11 organisations using that state for business. So it's actually got an enterprise side to it as well and during lockdown they saw increase in visitors by 50,000 50, people visiting the estate. Um, a couple more and then I'll almost wrap up. Um, City of Trees have been doing some great stuff um, we're, with showing just how powerful community forestry can be across the Northern Forest. This is with the charity Walking with the Wounded where um, they're working with uh, wounded service people from the Army and the Royal Logistics Corps. Um, 13 ex-servicemen and women have been involved with them uh, and they've planted incredibly over 20,000 trees across Greater Manchester. And then finally, going back to that jobs piece, um, City of Trees has been working with a charity called Back on Track, uh, which is helping vulnerable people get back into work. Uh, and here they're learning green skills, um, helping to, to sort of do tree planting, invasive removal, woodland management uh, and building bird boxes. Now, uh, I'll just wrap up by, by capping off how have we been doing in the first two years? of the Northern Forest. And here's a, what I'm calling a smorgasbord of stats for you. So um, altogether from that direct funding from the government, we've achieved 3 million trees planted. Um, 400,000 400, have just been planted across Yorkshire, 220,000 uh, by Manchester City of Trees. Uh, we've seen the Mersey Forest planting over 100,000. So we've had a significant impact um, and, and we're really making headway towards that 50 million tree target. So just almost to wrap up, I, the, where it comes down to for me on why we want to do the Northern Forest is the idea of creating this sort of beautiful North of England, uh, much more resilient and, and prosperity uh, runs through it as a thread um, uh, and a clear case in particular for creating greater equity and leveling up. And as you, I hope you've seen from some of the film clips, it's a very human uh, activity uh, massively involving uh, local communities. So I want to wrap up by saying where next. Um, and, and so uh, there are two bits I want to flag up for you really in terms of where we're going next with Northern Forest. And one is um, cheekily, we're going to say move over Emshire Park um, because what we want to do uh, is create a spatial master plan for the Northern Forest. So far, we've got a strong manifesto. We've got a great partnership and some amazing schemes on the ground, but we think there is an opportunity for us to um, adopt some of the very amazing practices that uh, some of the people on the <laughs> event today have been, probably been involved in, in creating a, a master plan that integrates all those plans and opportunities, works with uh, infrastructure development, um, uh, and in particular transport uh, and cycleways and creating green routes across the north. Um, and uh, any ideas or inputs from the audience today in the Q&A would be really helpful. We're also going to refresh our target because it could be that that 50 million we started with was just slightly too easy, um, given that we're possibly already close to 5 million now. Um, and we're going to focus on carbon capture and nature-based solutions as being a real thread for that. 
Um, and not forgetting, we want to make it easier for that cheeky red squirrel to get from coast to coast across the north of England. So that's uh, my introduction to the Northern Forest. Thank you very much. There's the web links that you can visit if you want to find out more. Alan, thanks very much and back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve, for a very stimulating talk. Beautiful, resilient, prosperous and human. Yep, that's uh, a very good way of doing it. So, so thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, we now have some time for questions and answers and quite a few have been beaming in. Um, so I think we can perhaps just take it from the beginning, really. Um, and the first one is from Didi Kohan to Katie. And it says, in my experience, when we talk of cities and urban greening, the focus is mostly on trees only. Grasslands, um, especially the, the local uh, less attractive grasses are often neglected and considered wastelands or lands that can be directed for other purposes. Mm -hmm. Are there cities that focus on their grass and scrubland species as well? Oh, thanks for that question. Um, I think particularly because I, I was talking, I mentioned, didn't I, about the reuse of grasslands in some of the new towns for their renewal. Um, and in those examples, I was talking particularly um, about the sort of huge expanses of, of municipal grassland and, and ways they can they can be used. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity in those places to think about um, some of those other types of, of uh, biodiversity increase and, and, and use of, of rewilding and different types of grassland for those areas in particular. And I think it's about finding the right solution in the right place. Um, in terms of examples of, of places that are doing that specifically, um, some of the examples that spring to mind of, in terms of new places are uh, possibly some of the China clay communities down in Cornwall. Um, some of the, so there and um, some of the other places such as Ebb's Fleet down in Kent uh, and the Neen Valley Park in Peterborough as well. I think uh, with the China Clay communities and with Ebb's Fleet, that, that reuse of um, former mining areas, I think, has provided a real opportunity to think strategically about what kind of um, biodiversity um, is going to be used there in terms of green infrastructure and I think particularly with the wetland areas in, in those sites as well there are some really interesting uses of uh, different types of, of grassland um, on those sites so um, I don't have a really clear answer to that question but I would, I would definitely check out those projects um, and they would potentially lead you to others as well. Thank you for that yes it's uh, um, an in very interesting question and I think colleagues in Poland have been researching um, the approach really of local communities to areas of grassland, particularly grassland that's been not cut and just left to be wild. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Right, a question for Christian and Steve from Eljandra Jaramello. How do you select the species to plant in certain sites? Christian, do you want to go first? The, the, yeah, the, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. We, uh, uh, in, in the in this, uh, example that we showed in, in Madrid, uh, we, we had uh, different uh, criteria at the same time. So <clears throat> uh, one, one is about the, the, the feeling of uh, uh, what you want to achieve. Uh, the the boulevard like like what I just uh, showed uh, was also meant to, to have a certain grandeur and uh, uh, should also have a, a, a feeling that people would uh, like to promenade uh, in and we looked at uh, examples of <clears throat> what what works in the city uh, uh, where what what is enjoyable what has the good uh, uh, also feel to it uh, in in the in the existing situation but also what is maintainable for the city. Uh, so we looked at the species that work well in, in the existing uh, site uh, and in the surrounding and could uh, deal with the drought and, uh, uh, and the soil conditions and uh, uh, the, 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 the existing climate. So very often we, we look at the, 
uh, existing situation and in the surrounding of the place to uh, look for the species that uh, that we apply and we speak uh, uh, with a maintenance um, uh, group to to see what are their experiences and uh, which species can be uh, surviving on the long term because we are very interested in in uh, establishing that. Thank you. Um, just for me, Alan, um, thankfully I've never been let loose with uh, <laughs> being allowed to select trees. Um, in fact, for, for many years I was, I was chairing Northwest Forestry Forum and was in, permanently terrified that I'd be led out to go and do a tree identification program because I'd be rubbish at it. Um, but what I can say that's been interesting in our recent discussions is um, Ash Dieback has given a new urgency to some of our work and uh, for Manchester City of Trees, for example, we identified around a million trees that we may lose. And so that's given us a, a, a new urgency. Um, and going back to Greg's presentation right at the start, we're just really conscious of that northward migration of habitats and, and how we need to have a, a discussion around how rigidly we stick to non-native species. And I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying it, but that has been a, a point of debate with the Woodland Trust, who are obviously very wedded to native species. And, and we're still discussing that with them as to how flexible we need to be in the face of uh, some of the high emission scenarios that Greg was touching on earlier. Thank you for that. Most uh, informative, I think. Yeah, thanks. Um, a question from Jane Morris, um, possibly aimed at Greg, but I'm sure other folks um, can, can have a say too, that given health, well-being, as well as climate and biodiversity crises, can our planting to increase permeability also increase spatial justice? I, I think that's a really interesting question. And I, I think the, we, we all know that, that economically, trees near houses add value to the houses, don't we? So we know that people, that people really benefit from, from green space. You know, the, the, the latest research for the World Economic Forum has shown that hearing bird song from your window is equivalent to a two thousand dollar pay rise. Apparently, you know they've they've counted it. You know, and 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 so so yes, you know, I I think that's definitely true. And, and we know, particularly in the north of England, where you know obviously Steve's familiar with, that we have, and in fact in Northern Ireland too, we have lots of spaces where where there is very little green infrastructure present. You know, and and they often are associated with the poorest parts of the country. So, so I think, yeah, I, I think those things re really, really matter. You know, I, I think, I think, you know, it, it should become, you know, I, I'd like it to be a, a, a sort of human right to be connected to green space. I think, I think, I think that would be a, mm -hmm. a really good thing. And, and, I, and I think if you talk to urban designers around the world, they, they nowadays, they, they, they would never design anything without green infrastructure. As, as part of the thing so so i think i think it is definitely related and and i I, th I think it would be great to get that incorporated somehow in in policy actually yeah thank you for that does anybody else want to comment or should we move on katie yeah hi yeah thanks i mean i would i would totally agree with that um but also just sort of highlight two Two additional points, really. I mean, one one thing that will hopefully in, um, assist in the broader adoption of that approach is the result of what has happened in the last year, and uh, you know, the realization amongst everybody of the importance of access to open space and green space for health and well-being. And it's kind of impossible for politicians to ignore that anymore. Um, so hopefully, that will be a positive. Um, driver for, for, for change beyond those practitioners and urban designers who, who know it's important already. Unfortunately in England, counter to that is what is currently happening with, with policy, which is uh, the deregulation of, of planning policy, which is basically government is um, enabling, is, is enabling permit, something called permitted development, which is development that can take place without planning permission. Um, and they're doing this to have a, enable a, a rapid increase in, in housing provision. Um, but one of the negative impacts of that in a lot of places is that because there's no planning permission, no process, there is therefore no contribution 
to green infrastructure, to schools, to all of these community facilities. And alongside that, there are no, um, the very minimal and in most places, no design standards which um, ensure that you have to have access to green space um, or any of these things that we know enable healthy and, and socially just places. So although we know that the government must wake up to the importance of this, what is happening in England in planning policies is really going to lead to slums which will, will do the opposite which is really difficult really scary times actually with that yeah sadly very true steve if you want to comment yeah just a quick one for me um i, well, I completely agree with katie and um and like greg i think access to green space should be human right and we should just make that absolutely fundamental um just as a point of interest for jane's question um, in the mapping for the Northern Forest and, and assessing priority areas, there are a number of different data layers we used and addressing social need was one of the key data layers. So we looked at levels of deprivation of different key areas and how much social good could we deliver through green infrastructure. So it, it is possible to build it into programmes like ours. Yes, thank you. Um, question for Christian, I think, from Chris Baines. The new town of Amstelveen was built next to Schiphol to accommodate the airport employees. It's a great inspiration as an ecological landscape with some of the best wildflower parks in Europe. Was there any interaction between West Eight and the local Amstel Vane experience? I, I cannot, uh, I, unfortunately I cannot answer this uh, question. I've been involved uh, only in some aspects uh, of, of the wildflower uh, plantings and the urban uh, planting. Uh, uh, within the project, uh, but but I've not been part of the larger group uh, in in the discussion with uh, <clears throat> surrounding uh, neighborhoods or the uh, surrounding uh, uh, participants of the of the urban tissue. Sorry for that. Okay, no, no, no worries. That's fine. Um, question for Katie from Paulo Hartman. Um, could you please talk about the importance of green corridors? in garden oblique urban planning? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, yeah. Talk about why they are, I mean, green corridors are an essential part of a multifunctional green infrastructure network, whether you're talking about the renewal of existing places or the design um, of, of a new place. Um, and I guess with a landscape led approach to creating new places that I was talking about, a key part of that would be understanding where those existing where existing wildlife networks are. Um, and with the current requirements, which about to be enforced about biodiversity net gain, they're a really important tool for designers to use to make sure that we're integrating opportunities for biodiversity net gain in new places um, but obviously it's not just about wildlife and biodiversity and plants and animals it's also about green corridors as a uh, means of movement uh, within um, urban areas so uh, using them as means to walk and cycle between places within an urban area but also really importantly connecting uh, with um, uh, the natural environment beyond the urban area as well. Um, and I think making sure you're integrating all of those things as part of that, that multifunctional network is, is absolutely uh, important. And it's, I guess, I mean, some of that might sound obvious, but I, I think what hopefully is encouraging that lots of the places that we work with through our various networks of places that are designing new places do understand that um, and um, where the, the resources and teams and skills are available to think about it early on enough, those, they, those green corridors are being integrated into the design of new places. Yes, thank you. It's very interesting, I think, picking up on some uh, a lot of the design issues from new towns. I gave a, a talk some years ago in China about the design of new towns and, and including Milton Keynes. And one of the, wasn't an attack but saying wow the grid why is it so squiffy why isn't it a proper grid and I said, ah do you know the name of the central boulevard and they said no and i said oh it's called midsummer boulevard do you know why and they said no and i said because there used to be an oak tree there and it's centered on that oak tree so that at sunrise on the longest day the sun shines straight down the boulevard on that oak tree and then there was silence and they said <laughs> A city has been based on that. And I said, yes, of course, it's based on the landscape that it's on. What? 
And they were absolutely staggered <laughs> that something like that could actually... It's called Big Summer Boulevard, isn't it, even? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. That's not about me. Last question, probably, again, from um, Nitty, I think probably aimed at Greg. Currently, what is the scope of usage for space syntax at a global level? Uh, I... Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, actually. Um, space syntax is, is meant for quite small spaces, really, and the methodology has been proven to work for that. For the, for the bigger spaces, we're using a, a much more complex graph-based analysis, uh, which, which, is, which is sort of um, comes out of it, ecological um, research. So, you know, I, I'm just, we're just publishing a paper on the results of that. So I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps... Um, Put that in the chat when 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 we can. But but yeah, space syntax is really for for small connective connective tissue, really. Yeah, thank you for that. There are one two other questions, but I think that time is catching up with us, my friends, and we must draw this session to a close. On behalf of the European Forum and the conference attendees, may I thank the speakers, Greg, Katie, Christian, and Steve for their excellent contributions to this session and to the conference as a whole. One of the aims of this session was to broaden the spectrum of what urban forestry is about and to prove that urban forestry has the potential to elevate the experiential over the quantifiable. And I think you have achieved that wonderfully well. And as we walk down the road in the approximate direction of the future, I think we can see that urban forestry both can and is one of the leading choreographers of us achieving our resilient futures. So thank you very much indeed. And I will now hand you back to the governor, Clive, and thank you very much indeed for your time. You make me sound like a gangster rather than <laughs> governor, but um, some might say that's appropriate. <laughs> Alan, I think also to thank you for your, um, uh, your skilled um, moderation today. It's been an excellent session. And on behalf also of the steering, international steering group, I'd like to thank the speakers too. Um, just before I do the wrap up, um, I was slightly amused by one of Steve's slides um, towards the end where he was saying that he wanted the Northern Forest to uh, overtake the um, work in uh, the Amstel Landscape Park. Because actually, Steve, if you're still listening, you have the opportunity to listen to uh, the lady who has probably done more than uh, um, for, than anybody in the urban forestry of that project um, tomorrow morning, if you can get up at 7 a.m., uh, when Renate Spaeth, who will be shortly retiring uh, from uh, the government of North Rhine-Westphalia, where she's head of uh, forestry, will, uh, will be speaking. And I'll use that as a plug, actually, for um, the rest of the EFUF programme. Uh, which will uh, continue uh, from now until uh, late May. Uh, so how to find out about what's coming next? Um, you will see on your screen the MyEFUF app. You can download it um, uh, just by uh, pointing your um, camera, if you've got a, spark, a smartphone camera, uh, at the QR code or visit the App Store or Google Play. And uh, on the EFUF website, uh, a lot of the same, in fact, almost all of the same information is available there. So what's coming up? Well, I've already mentioned that we have the last in a series of guest rooms um, taking place tomorrow uh, with Renate Spaeth uh, from uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. We'll be talking about her work on, uh, on urban forestry and the wild urban forest uh, which has been a huge feature of urban forest thinking over the last generation. We also have uh, coming up very soon, um, and I would encourage people who are interested in issues of gender equality uh, to attend this on the 10th of May um, between 6.30 and 8 p.m. Um, that is a uh, webinar on gender equality in urban forestry. Uh, reality or utopia and we have speakers there from uh, Canada, from, um, uh, from Belgium and from Switzerland uh, taking place uh, in that. Um, 
we move from Manchester to Switzerland uh, for the next stage of this year's um, uh, EFUF semester. Um, and uh, included in that are several webinars, which you may well find interesting. Um, for example, on the 18th of May, there's a webinar on monitoring ecosystem services in Swiss cities. Uh, on the 19th of May, uh, philosophical thoughts on social isolation in consideration of the tree. So we'll be uh, looking at philosophy um, on um, trees that day. Uh, and then on the 20th of May, uh, green spaces and urban densification. Uh, which is a, I suspect, a huge nature-based solutions issue because of um, the policy across all European cities and beyond to go for densification rather than extensification. Um, but the uh, EFUF semester does not end with the Swiss week. We have already got in planning an event in June, with yet, yet to be promoted. So the My EFUF app will remain your portal all the way through till 2022, when we will be meeting again for a physical forum, um, probably combined with online events. Uh, but I'm not gonna steal the thunder of the organizers for that because they will be a reveal of that towards the end of the Swiss week. So with that, thank you again to uh, our partners, EFI, the Clearinghouse Project, and most of all, um, <clears throat> Manchester City of Trees and um, I wish you uh, a very good rest of the day and look forward to meeting you again at future European Forum on Urban Forestry events. Thank you.